This is The Road Show, and I'm your host, David Warren. In my 35-plus years of interviewing authors on this program, I've only said the following statement about a guest's book maybe three times. It rocked my world. Today's guest and today's topic is one of those times. Joining us for the first time is Joseph Morris, author of End Times Made Easy. Let's welcome to the program, Joseph Morris. Good to have you with us, Joseph. Great to be with you. Nice to meet you, too. I might call you Joe. I already like you. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, surely I'm not the first person to tell you that this book rocked his or her world. <laughs> what kind of feedback are you getting on this book? You know, really uh, a lot because people want facts and, and it, yeah, the people will fact check you. And uh, even the guys that uh, did the book at Harrison House, they said, you know, we were going through all these fact check and th- these all happened. I said, well, I'm not smart enough to come up with this. So it literally is events happening that point to his return that are real blatant, real clear. So that's what the response has been from the book. Have you found that Christians just have a mindset about end times that, oh, that's just too hard for me to understand. I need to go find somebody to explain everything to me. It's sad, isn't it? I mean, I'll have a lady walk up to me after almost every conference go, I've been lied to my entire life, that it was all bad news. And it's weird that uh, that was what was portrayed, you know, as a kid, oh, the coming of the Lord. It was all uh, dark and mean and gloomy. And here the Lord wants us expectant and excited. So that's the difference, yeah. What turned you on to Bible prophecy and eschatology? Oh, gosh, years ago, I started preaching, traveling in 86, and uh, the Lord told me to preach on it. And I said, I don't want to do that because I thought it was weird. But I always had a, a, could remember it really well and could put it together. I don't know how. It just made sense to me, and it was simple. And, uh, and then when, as I got into it, like you said, it's like when, we, when it comes to Revelation, it comes to end times, people have bizarre uh, thought patterns. So, uh, you know, I'm a word guy. So it's funny about righteousness, we go to the Bible. Healing, we go to the Bible. Prosperity, we go to the Bible. When it comes to end times, people go by all kinds of weird traditions. <laughs> and the, the Bible makes it super clear, that's for sure. I think probably uh, my biggest challenge in this area on end times is getting the timeline sure. straight. Do you find that a lot? Yeah, because you know everybody wants to know what the, the the big verse is. You know, you can't tell when the Lord's coming back, and I'm like, well, you you actually can if you look. You can tell how close you are by all the signs. They're kind of blatant. So, well, I think it will appeal to our listeners to know that you have quite a pedigree in Bible school training. Do you want to tell the listeners where you studied? Sure, sure. I went to Raymond in 1980. Just ble- beyond blessed to get to be there to hear Kenneth Hagin and hear the other teachers and. Just Brother Hagen's life of uh, not being moved by what you see, not being moved by what, how you feel, but being moved by the Word, and uh, just a, an appreciation for the Word and for Jesus. Yeah, I, I was thank God I got to go to Rama. Yes, your book, which is called End Times Made Easy, and we'll dive into the book here in just a few moments. But I want to lay some groundwork, let people get to know you a little bit better before we start talking about it. Uh, Jesus appeared to you. Tell us about that appearance. Yeah, uh, he had uh, appeared a couple times before about certain meetings I was going to be in, but in 87, I was in my middle bedroom praying, and uh, uh, all of a sudden I started crying. I'm like, man, why am I crying? I'm a happy person. I'm, and I was crying because of the goodness of God. And then Jesus came and stood right in front of me, white robe, white sash, and uh, he said, I want you to preach on the coming of the Lord. And I said, well, I, I don't want to do that. He said, it doesn't matter what you want to do, it's what you're supposed to do. And uh it's amazing how even knowing you're not doing what you're supposed to do, he's still kind to you. So so I, I just, uh, a buddy of mine in Boston, Jonathan Del Turco, he said, I want you to come do end times. I said, sure, in the Bible school. I thought like an hour. He goes, no, I want you to do 12 hours. I go, 12 hours? I said, no way. There's no way. This is like 1984, 85. Mm-hmm. I said, there's no way I can do 12 hours. So uh, the Lord kind of pushed me into it. And I didn't even realize that there was a need for it, but, uh, just the way it was presented. I bet it's been a wild ride. Really has. It's really been weird for me to actually see now people liking the message because I plowed for so many years where they didn't that I think people are be like, are you really? Uh, and I'm like, okay, it's so much more fun. Let's start now by me reading just the uh, first little bit of chapter two. You write, the apostle Peter had a lot to say about the culture of the last days, how society would be thinking, acting, and going about their lives. In Peter's day, some 2,000 years ago, the early church would have been excited about Jesus' return. They would have thought, wow, Jesus is coming. I can hardly wait to see him again. But clearly, that is not the case today. 
With spiritual insight, Peter looked ahead to the culture of the day when Jesus was about to return and described a fleshly people who scoffed at the return of Jesus. Joseph, you wrote, truer words were never spoken. How would you describe this last day culture in which we live? Yeah, it's really divided to where you got certain, even in the church, you know, certain people are expectant and excited that he's coming back. So many people don't want him to come back. And oftentimes even word people are like, well, I don't want the Lord to come back because I feel like I got so much in my heart. And I go, well, you're going to live forever. Of course you got a lot in your heart. So they think the rapture of the coming of the Lord is the end and it's really the beginning. So, you know, some groups you come across uh, that very thing, they're scoffing. Ah, we've been hearing that all of our lives. And that's what Peter said it would be. It would be, he said, don't fall from your own steadfastness. Don't let their, the error of the wicked is what he called it. So it's amazing how people, you've run across them, and some people are expecting and excited. Some people are like, oh, I don't want that to happen, because there's so much fear attached to it. Well, later in chapter 2, you wrote, some 2,000 years ago, God inspired Peter to warn us that if we don't watch it, the error of the wicked will creep into the church. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? You can feel that. I mean, you can feel that like... uh, Oh, Peter said the people are willingly ignorant, and really, I like one translator said, "stupid on purpose." It's almost like when it comes to end times, people are afraid of of uh, jumping into it because of what they've heard over the years. I found it interesting that on the front of the book, the subtitle of "End Times Made Easy" is "There is no bad news for the Christian." What? possessed you to put that on there? Well, I think it's uh, people walking up to me afterwards going, you know, I've been afraid of the coming of the Lord my whole life. And mm-hmm. I said, well, how, what was it like the night before you got married? Were you excited? I said, were you afraid the night before you got married? And it, and it really wakes them up like, no, we're supposed to be happy, joyful. And you know, as you get into all of it, the Lord reminds me over and over and over again to tell them how much I love them. So the coming of the Lord is to make people have a peace in them that he loves me, and I'm about to see him. There's nothing cooler than the songs we sing, then all of a sudden we're going to see him face to face. I love that. Well, here are some interesting facts to take us to our first break. One-third of the Bible is prophecy, and there are eight times more scriptures on the second coming of Jesus than his first coming. Yes. All right. We're talking about End Times Made Easy with author Joseph Morris. I'm David Warren, your host. And when we come back, we're going to dive into chapter four, which is entitled 75 Plus Signs of Jesus Return. We'll return right after this. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. I'm David Warren here in Studio B with our guest today, Joseph Morris. He is the author of the new book, End Times Made Easy. Again, that subtitle is There's No Bad News for the Christian. So this is a happy show, folks. Jesus (laughs) is coming. We're going to tell you how soon he's coming or give you some clues here in just a few moments. But uh, one of the things I did in preparation, because you all know I'm an A-type personality and I read the book and I listen to the podcasts with the guest on so I get a feel for what he or she is going to be like. And uh, one of the things I've heard you say, Joe, is that whenever you're on a program, a lot of times you're being fact-checked in the moment to see, is this guy on the up and up? Does he know what he's talking about? (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. They'll be interviewing you, and I'm sitting there going, they're fact-checking me. And I'll say that, you're fact-checking me while we're doing this. Oh, yeah. They want it to be real. And especially young people, while you're doing it in the congregation, they'll pull them up on their phone while you're preaching. Because they want genuine. And I told him, I said, well, I'm not smart enough to come up with this on my own. Hello, this is like 100 signs or 80 signs that he's about to come back. So where did you get all these facts from? Oh, just scouring things over the years. I mean, you just kind of accumulate them and put them all together because they're so blatant. And uh, a lot of uh, information from different sites in Israel when one thing pops up and one another thing pops up, we don't get all that information. Our news doesn't cover any of that stuff at all. So, 
Okay, so we're now at chapter 4, 75 plus signs of Jesus' return, and we will start with numbers 1 and 2, which are really the most important. What is the number one sign of Jesus' return? Uh, The gathering of Israel back to their land. Number one. Yeah, amazing. The one thing God said that we would say he can't do, he's already done it. And uh, the amazing thing about that is a lot of Jews will get off a plane and come in the land and go, I don't even know why I'm here. Something drew me here. And that's what Paul said in Romans. When you see Israel regathered, what's it mean for the church? Life, everlasting, resurrection. So that's what it should preach to us that we're about to be caught up. Yeah. And then number two, the second sign of Jesus' return that you brought out in the book is that Jerusalem was won back in 1967. Tell us about why that's such an important event. Man, you know, Jesus really tied it to those two events. He said, when you see these things, and that's Jerusalem being won back, and it's weird how Jerusalem, the Bible says, will be a cup of trembling for all nations. I mean, the capital of the world forever. And uh, you see, if you live west of Jerusalem, you read left to right. If you live east of Jerusalem, you read right to left. Everything uh, centers around that, that capital. If you, if you stand there and look at the Temple Mount, it's ominous to go, well, that's the Lord's address, you know, forever. So it hits you, wow, he, he, this is his spot. And you, I mean, you see the, the devil try to put mosques and stuff everywhere. Jesus did something important thinking he could stop it or cover it up. All it did was give you a tour guide. You know, a mosque is there. What happened there? Jesus was raised from the dead. What happened there? That's where he was beaten. So, uh, yeah, Jerusalem's the deal. Pretty, pretty cool how that's the center. So what is the timeline tie-in to these two events? Like how soon is Jesus coming back, in your opinion, from what we just said, Israel being made a nation in 1948 and Mm -hmm. then Jerusalem being won back in 1967? You know, you can do the math several different ways because Jesus said, I'm coming back after two days. Like there's eight references that I'll be back after 2,000 years. And then you have to kind of figure out when he went to the cross. And when Gabriel was telling Daniel when Jesus was going to come the first time, he didn't count when he was born. He counted when he rode into triumphantly into Jerusalem. And that was 30 or 31 or 32 or 33 A.D. At 2,000 years to that, you're at 2030, 2032. Take away seven years for the tribulation, you're at 2025, 20, 26. Uh, you're, however, there's several different ways to do the math. However you do it, it's, it's blatant. I think you should repeat that last part because we're not too far from those years you just mentioned. Exactly. And I think along with that, I mean, you you take those 2,000 years, and it's amazing how you can't find the exact year of the crucifixion. You can study everything from Europe, everything all over the world, and different ones show you 30, 31, 32, or 33. Oh, you add 2,000 years to that because Jesus said, I'm coming back after 2,000 years. And you're at 2030, 2031, 2032, 2033, take away seven years, and you are you go from 2025 to 2026. I'm not giving you the year he's coming back, but you can. there's like five or six different ways to add things up. And Jesus said the generation or the group of people that sees those two events, Israel regathered and Jerusalem went back. He said that's the group I'm coming back for. So I hear people say, well, I don't believe that. Well, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> they say, well, I, I'm not comfortable with that. It, it really doesn't matter. He said, tag, you're it. If you're the part of that group. And the amazing thing is how clear he made it in Luke 21. He's like, okay, when you see Jerusalem one back, you see Israel made a nation. That's that's the group I'm coming for. Wow, I had never heard that math done that way. Now, you mm-hmm. said you subtracted seven years. For the tribulation, yes. So you're saying that we would be raptured before the tribulation, we Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yes, correct. Is that pretty standard belief among prophecy teachers? Pretty standard because you can't rectify everything. If you take a few things out of order, uh, it it messes everything up. So uh, pretty standard. There's still a lot of people that go, oh, the church has to go through the tribulation. I'm like, you know, to purify them. I said, no, the blood of Jesus purifies us. If going through hell purified us, we'd all be glowing in the dark. <laughs> so, and then if that was true, he'd have to resurrect every generation and make them go through the tribulation. So the tribulation doesn't get the church ready for Jesus. The tribulation puts pressure on people to make a decision. We think of it as judgment, but really it's the mercy of God, because most people wait till the very end. Like my dad, he mocked God his whole life, and then he has a stroke, and then he's like, get saved, and then goes on to be with the Lord. So, uh, yeah, intriguing how we it was presented that all these things were bad, and yet they were presented, look at the mercy of God through the thread of the whole bit of it. 
We're talking about end times being made easy, and Joseph Morris, the author of this book on Harrison House Publishers, is with us today. I'm David Warren, your host, and we're in the section of the book about the 75-plus signs of Jesus' return, and let's put the word soon in there, soon return. Number four is that the Hebrew language would be restored. Why is that a big deal? Uh, just the um, um, sheer miracle of it. I mean, you can go to Israel, no one's speaking Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite, but everyone's speaking Hebrew. 120 years ago, no one spoke Hebrew. One guy, Elie Ben Yehuda, said, you know what, we used to speak Hebrew, we should. Came up with new words for airplane and fountain pen. And uh, what what an amazing thing for God to give them their own voice back again, what it originally was. So and so why do you think that's prophetic, speaking Hebrew? Oh, not necessarily prophetic, but if God said, I'm going to do that and then does it, it's kind of like, wow, here's a checklist right here. And that would that's a wake-up sign for me just before the coming of the Lord that would happen, and it's, and it's happened in my day. All right. Uh, the 15th sign of Jesus' return found in the book is that there would be one world currency in the future. What signs are you seeing of that? Boy, there's just pressure from every group, especially this year and last year, you know, converting to one. The Pope said four times, we need one world religion, one world authority, and one world monetary system. And then you got leaders of different nations going, we've got to have one currency. The problem was, if you converted to one currency, the float time, people lost too much money. Now with artificial intelligence, the float time goes into instantaneous. So right now, you've got people pushing in Europe We've got to have one monetary system. It makes sense, but what's scary is it's doing exactly what the Bible said it would do. And what are they saying the benefits would be of having a one-world currency? Just ease of transactions. You know, when you're dealing with, uh, uh, well, I was in Germany. Now they're euros, but you know, you, back in the old days it was marks, and it was just complex. And it makes sense to do it, but I think the Antichrist comes on that whole thought pattern of control. And uh, Hey, speaking of that, I'm going a little off script here. I will not mention the name of the grocery store, but there's an ability now where you can <laughs> yeah. just, is it show your palm? My wife did it the other day. I said, honey, you, you just paid for your groceries with your palm. It freaked me out. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. How did you do that? And she said, well, I entered my information. And I said, oh, gosh, that's weird. Yeah. Now, that is not getting the the chip, right? No, that's not getting the mark. A, a different friend of mine down in Florida, he had a guy that had a chip in his wrist and put his hand right over the deal and it, it scanned it just like a like a product. It's crazy. But does that does the chip, the mark of the beast, that doesn't happen before we're raptured, does right, it? Right, that's after we're raptured, yeah. Thank God. Yes. Yes, thank God. All right, we're talking about signs of Jesus return. You mentioned a one world religion. Now, mm -hmm. who's going to get on board for that? Boy, people are pushing for it all the time right now. It's just, it, you know, the, all the coexist signs. It's all convert to one group. And uh, that pressure of making sure you don't leave anybody out or, you know, it's like that we're weird because we believe Jesus is the only way. <laughs> you know, I'm not actually weird. I'm just trying to be biblical. And, and that's what I like about the Bible. The Bible tells us this is going to happen before it happens. And that's how God said this is how you can tell I'm God. Okay, the 23rd sign of Jesus' return, as found in the book End Times Made Easy by Joseph Morris, is, and boy, this has been in the news, Russia amassing troops and equipment in the Ukraine. How is this prophetic? Well, uh, the Bible says that after the rapture, you have the Ezekiel 38 war, and Russia uh, comes down on Israel to defeat Israel, and 82% uh, of, of it is wiped out. So you see the setup for that right now with, I've got pictures of, of Russia's leader, Iran's leader, and Turkey's leader all having an alliance, and that alliance happens in Ezekiel 38. I hear people say, well, how do you think, why do you think it happens after the rapture? Well, because God physically intervenes, and during the church age, he doesn't. I mean, Germany killed six million Jews and prospered because God's not interfering during the church age. He gave the church all authority. The moment the church is taken off the earth, he protects Israel like Old Testament-like. And uh, so, I mean, I know a lot of people will go back and forth on that, but wow, what an event. That's going to be a wake-up call for people to see God push people back that are trying to annihilate Israel. Joe, you know, I've heard, as I've listened to prophecy teachers throughout the years, I've always heard Russia and I've heard Iran, mm -hmm. but it isn't until recently that I've heard Turkey mentioned. Sure. Boy, they've been a player, and uh, because of uh, the cities there, of, of where their doctrine is, their Messiah is going to come out of that region. So that made Turkey a real uh, focal point for their religion. 
All right, uh, number 31 of the signs of Jesus' return is that global communications would be available for the world to see the two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? You know, that's the two prophets during the tribulation that come that do radical signs that the Antichrist can't stand and eventually kills them. Then they're raised from the dead, but uh, they can call down fire from heaven. Uh, everybody says it's Moses and Elijah. Some people say it, says it has to be Enoch and Moses. I mean, Enoch and Elijah, because neither one of them died. But, I mean, us being in the Christians, as far as the rapture goes, we'll be caught up and don't have to die. So probably, I think it's going to be Moses and Elijah. And the global communications, are you thinking cell phones in everybody's hands? Yeah, I think when that those verses came out and John said that, you're like, wait a minute, how could everybody see this at once? And now we all have cell phones and you can see everything happening mm-hmm. all right right in front of your eyes. Right. Yeah. You know, even when there's an amber alert, sure. you know, somebody's been kidnapped, mm-hmm. all the phones go off. Yes. So I would assume that when something happens down the road in prophecy, yes. everybody's phone around the world will go off. I would think so, absolutely, yes. Wow. Wow. Well, what are some of the signs? I've still got my list to go here, but what are some of the signs that are in the book that you're most excited about that you're seeing take place? I think it's the different parts of nature. I mean, all of a sudden you had foxes show up on the Temple Mount. You had fish in the Dead Sea. Uh, you have 172 different species of predatory birds show up. And I thought, that's crazy. You're after the Ezekiel 38 war, God calls on the fowl of the air you know, to clean the land up. And then at the Battle of Armageddon, he calls on the birds again to clean the land up. So you got the cleanup crew in Israel right now. So watching fish get in position, birds get in position, Russia get in position, you're, the Temple Mount Institute, how all these different groups are, are literally in position. But then in the church, people go, well, how can you tell the Lord's coming back? And well, there's obvious, blatant things that are like, man, this is the setup for the return of the king. The 53rd sign of Jesus' return in your book is about the worldwide persecution of Christians. And I would say about 20 years ago, you really didn't feel that. Right. But you write in the book, the plan of God always goes full circle. The early church was persecuted at the beginning, and it will be the same at the end and what does that look like how do you think we're being persecuted well i think it's man i can't believe that i'm saying this i watched a news show the other day when i was in illinois preaching and the guy said i'm so glad i got to see it he said uh the the trouble with america now is white conservative christian males they're the terrorists Hmm. so because i'm a christian conservative male i'm a terrorist i don't think so so most men that are conservative christians take their family to church so look at how that spun to, in, in our generation, I'm the weirdo because I'm trying to be biblical, that I'm strange. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned about the late-night hosts making jokes about Jesus' return. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's exciting, but it's not funny. Isn't that something how it used to, even sinners had a little bit of a reverence for God and even a reverence for a preacher, and now the whole thing's switched completely around. I mean, look at the thought pattern of Israel right now that people just can't, st- all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they can't stand Israel. All right, before we go to break, speaking of Israel, I saved this one for the final sign to discuss during this segment, and it is number 71. And I want you to tell us why this is important prophetically. West Bank settlements provoke Ezekiel 38 war. Yeah, see, in the midst of what's happening now since October 7th, even before that, you had all these things happening in the West Bank. There were It's hard to separate and find the terrorists in there because you got so many groups and so many different uh, crews living in the West Bank. And uh, a couple of friends of mine that were in Israel said, we're getting to the point where all of a sudden this is going to explode as we get closer to the Ezekiel 38 war. And it's right. kind of happening right in front of our eyes. Well, here's a wake-up call. The players or the countries of the Ezekiel 38 war are either in position or they're moving into position. And according to you, Joe, that war takes place after the rapture of the church or us Christians listening today. I believe so. Which means that's very soon. Yes. I mean, as shocking as that is, we can't help it if we are that close to it. We just are. (laughs) All right, your new book, End Times Made Easy. Tell us where people can get it. They can go to josephmorse.com and get it. They can, uh, it's at a couple different uh, secular bookstores, Barnes & Noble. 
Uh, I can't remember the name of the other one, but uh, it's it's mainly josephhorns.com, and we'll try to get it out to you as soon as we can. Is it on Amazon? It is on Amazon. Yep, All right, amazon.com, sure. and yep. you also have an audio book on audible.com. Yes. So you can look that up, End Times Made Easy, by today's very special guest, Joseph Morris. I'm David Warren, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the rapture <laughs> of the church. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, one of the hosts you hear on the Oasis Network Roadshow. For 35 years, this one hour of the day has inspired and motivated you, our listeners, with thousands of stories of people whose lives demonstrate the truth that with God, all things are possible. It's an hour that you should make a part of your day, Monday through Friday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation. Here's a little bit about today's guest, Rev. Joseph Morris. He has been traveling for over 30 years, encouraging believers to use their supernatural equipment for the harvest and awakening the church to the soon return of Jesus. Joseph hosts End of Day's Update, infusing believers with precise and hopeful signs of Jesus' return. I'm David Warren, enjoying this roadshow immensely. And Joe, I just said that you have what's called an End of Day's Update, and I have been binge listening to that. That is your podcast. So it's available on all the platforms, so just look up End of Day's Update, correct? Correct, or you can go to josephmorris.com, and there's a button right there, and push it, and it'll take you right to it. And yeah. you're also on YouTube, are you not? Yes, sir, on YouTube, and uh, and the broadcast, I thought we'd do it two weeks, and we've been going almost 15 years, so you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's every Wednesday you have a new edition. Yes, sir. And I'll tell you why that's so important is because, you know, you finally had to say the end to this new book we're talking about called End Times Made Easy, but I guarantee you, while it was being printed, you probably had more things you wanted to put in the book about signs of Jesus' return. What has taken place since this book came out, again, not that old, that yeah. that, that you wish could go in or that you talk about on your End of Days Update podcast? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, the, the Last fall, the Dead Sea turned blood red where Sodom and Gomorrah was. And I thought, well, that's kind of amazing. And then I looked it up, and guess what day it happened on? The Day of Atonement. And I mean, why why is that significant? I mean, just the showing that he would atone for our sins, that he made the, the Dead Sea turn blood red, that even Sodom and Gomorrah, as bad as it was, he paid for that. I mean, to me, I was like, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you're just showing off now. This is over the top. Because I said it on my End of Days update one Wednesday and didn't even know it was on the Day of Atonement. Then I looked it up the next week. I was like, oh, dear Lord, this is just crazy. You can't make this stuff up. This is unreal. Yeah. Okay, so what is the next item on an end times timeline of uh, what you're seeing right now this is the, the amazing thing is there israel being at war with hamas and next it'll be hezbollah it has to get really 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 bad there for them to start looking for the messiah and then for a guy a, a leader to come on the scene and go okay we've got to stop this war and the jews are going to think oh wow this guy's the messiah he, he's brought a peace agreement and made this stuff work so it's got to get horrific before them to start looking that bad at the you know for a, a savior basically or the Messiah. And who's this leader you're referring to? Well, the Bible calls him uh, the Antichrist, and he's. What the sad thing is that he, he's going to look like the Messiah, but he's going to end up being Lucifer incarnate. Yeah. Okay, but that takes place after the Church of Jesus Christ is raptured out of here. Yes, he he can't be revealed till we leave. Paul said. Okay. Um, before we dive into chapter 6, which is entitled The Rapture, let's unpack the verse Matthew twenty four fourteen. We've all heard it. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And I think for people like me, I'll, I'll put myself in this group of, <laughs> of ignorant mm. Christians, mm. and that's not a bad word. That just means we're not informed yet, uh, thinking, oh, well, Jesus isn't coming that soon because the whole world hasn't heard about him and have been able to receive him as Lord and Savior. So talk about that a bit. Boy, that's probably one of the most misunderstood verses. You you got from verse 1 to verse 8 is is church age. From verse 9 is when the tribulation starts. All these people will go, well, we can't. Jesus can't come to every person saved. That verse is a mid-tribulation verse. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, that's mid-trib. Midway through the trib, the Antichrist goes in. 
And he's still talking about the gospel of the kingdom. And then you get to the latter part of Matthew. He says, well, one's taken and one's left. That's not the rapture. That's the second coming. That's where the wicked are taken off the earth. So all of the gospels don't speak at all about the rapture. They always speak of the second coming. And the epistles is where the, the rapture doctrine is, is, is brought in. So people today on TV, I'll listen to them. They'll go, well, this and this and this. But they're all using verses from the gospels, which are all second coming verses. So there, where you just quoted, people think, well, uh, the Lord can't come back till every person's heard. Well, actually, the biggest revival, and I'm going to be scriptural now, the largest revival is after the church leaves. We, we're promised double of what the book of Acts was, but the Bible says that the number is it's innumerable that get saved during the tribulation. What will life be like on earth after the church leaves? Oh, man, could you imagine what, how horrific it's going to get so fast? Uh, I, I just think about how... Things today, uh, instantaneously, you got the response to it. Can you imagine what the technology is going to be the moment the church disappears? It's going to be chaos, I think. So will it freak out the rest of the world when Christians are raptured? I think so. I mean, it's interesting. You respond with it through humility or haughtiness. The haughty ones will go, I don't believe that. The other ones that will humble themselves and go, I'm going to get saved. Because the Bible gives you a 200 million man army at the second coming. But it can't tell you how many people are, are saved during the trib. Innumerable is what the Bible says. And you look at the percentage at the second coming, one's taken and one's left, that's 50%. So Germany's going to have a 47% revival. France going to have a you know 49% revival. So when you say on the cover of your book, there is no bad news for the Christian, is that because we're not a part of the tribulation? Correct. We're caught up before, and that, that freaks people out. But it's very, very clear in Daniel chapter 9 that the, the seven-year period is for the Jews and for Jerusalem, not the church. Okay, but if you're not Jewish, you can still accept Christ? Yes, absolutely. But the purpose is for Jews to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Correct. The Bible says a spirit of supplication comes upon the whole nation. All of a sudden their eyes are open and uh, they turn to him. Well, folks, I'm just trying to keep up, <laughs> just so you know that. I'm talking with Joseph Morris. He is the author of End Times Made Easy. And I got to say, and I'm not just saying this because you're looking at me across the table here in Studio B, but you are the person that has made this the easiest for me to understand because I had some things backwards until I read your book. Wow. Like, right. because I'll tell, I'll give you a perfect example. The scripture about uh, Jesus in the clouds, we sh we'll meet him in the clouds, mm -hmm. and Jesus' second coming. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought that was the same thing. It, uh, so many people do, absolutely, sure. So which one is which? Well, the rapture of the church, we go up to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, we bodily come back with him where he physically comes down to the Mount of Olives. That's the two different events. All right, and what have we been doing that whole time? That whole time, during that seven-year period, we go to the reward seat of Christ. It's called the judgment seat, but that's a mistranslation. In the Greek, it's the word bema, B-E-M-A. It means reward seat, just like in the Olympics when you go to get a gold, silver, or bronze medal. I've never seen an Olympian going, oh, I don't want to go do that. I'm afraid of it. But it's been portrayed as judgment. But really, technically, it's uh, the reward seat. <laughs> and that's what Jesus said. Remember, I'm coming back, and I'm going to kill everybody. No, he said, I'm coming back, and my reward is with me. So it gets perverted by Lucifer to think that Jesus is the bad guy when he's all mercy, all love, all compassion. Okay, we'll loop back to that because I sure. pushed uh, too far ahead, I think, there. Let's go back to the rapture. Okay. You write in uh, your book on page 121, sometimes Christians have this tendency to think that when we are raptured, we will go to heaven and become like robots, losing all personality. No. Some people think we will lounge around on fluffy clouds playing harps all cherub-like. No. Religious tradition has given us some crazy, totally unscriptural ideas. Listen to me now, you say, Joe. Jesus was showing the disciples and you just how supernaturally natural the glorified body is. Jesus was showing you his glorified body as a picture of your future. He was showing you that you won't be a ghost. You will still have an appetite. You will walk right through walls. You will still have muscle and bone and will still be recognized. How cool is that, you write. And then you say, as I travel teaching on end times, there's one question I get more than any other. Do you remember what that one question is? No. <laughs> you say, a sweet little lady will almost always raise her hand and ask, mm. will I know my husband in heaven? 
amazing over and over again. I said, well, what, do you want to know him? <laughs> but isn't that weird that people think once we're raptured that they lose all their thought pattern or, or, or all of a sudden their minds evacuated out of their brain or something or taken away? No, very normal. I tell people, if you like to play the guitar, you play the guitar better. If you like to sing, you'll sing better. I mean, everything is intensified. I like that where Jesus walks through the wall and shows us that uh, that's your new body. And the first thing he asked for was, do you have any meat? He didn't say, do you have any kale? He didn't say, do you have any salad? <laughs> I mean, he said, he said, where's the beef? And and so he's showing them, I have an appetite. You can, I, and they said, well, he's a spirit. He goes, no, no, handle me. A spirit has not flesh and bone, as you see I have. So it's so weird that people, are, the portrayal of what our future is like is floating around. You see in all the movies, they're floating on clouds. We're tasting of the powers of the world to come. We're not done. We've got a whole thousand years to rule with him. One of the things I love about you, Joseph Morris, is your sense of humor. So I'm assuming that we will maintain our senses of humor. I hope so. I, and as crazy as the church is, I think the Lord's so normal. Bless his heart that he's been presented as the weirdo. And he's nor the, the highest amount of normal could be, that's for sure. He is the coolest person we will ever meet. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Jesus Christ. Okay, so... One of the things that really piqued my interest when I was listening to the audible book of End Times Made Easy by you, Joseph Morris, for those just turning on their radios, I'm David Warren, your host, and uh, I love how you pointed out how the Jewish feast calendar points to rapture timing, when the rapture will take place. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that we won't know exactly when the rapture will take place, but we're given signs to give us a a very strong or very strong clues, plural, as to when it will take place. Yes, you know, those festival days were dress rehearsals for the real. I mean, Passover was a picture of Jesus going to the cross, and then you had the Festival of Unleavened Bread. I mean, you it's weird those were dress rehearsals so that when you saw the real, it was obvious. I mean, Jesus went to the cross on Passover, buried on unleavened bread. They, they take three pieces of bread, the middle piece, they would fold it and pierce it and break it. He said, I am the bread of life. Born in Bethlehem means home of the bread. So he flawlessly fulfilled those, showing he's the Messiah. Passover, unleavened bread, then first fruits, what happened? He was raised from the dead. Fifty days later, Pentecost. After that, you got the Feast of Trumpets. Now, that's the next one on the calendar. And that's kind of when the Lord said, of that day and that hour, no one knows. They looked at each other and said, he just said, I'm coming back for you on Feast of Trumpets. Because to them, they knew exactly what that was. It was a two-day period when the new moon would be on the 29.5th day of the month. So the Sanhedrin would go out and say, Give me, let them see what day it is. So when he said that, they, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, he's telling us when he's coming back. So the very verse that people used to say he can't tell when he's coming was to tell them there's a two-day period when I'm going to come. And Paul said, hey, you are not in darkness that that day would overtake you as a thief. So I, I hear people get mad about that. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at Paul. Paul's the one that said that, and the Holy Spirit told him to say that. When the world says peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, not us, not the church. He said, you are not of the night. You're not of darkness that that day would overtake you. So Paul was pretty clear there saying it won't take you by surprise, even though we know that we've been taught our whole lives you can't tell when the, Lord, when the rapture is going to be. Now, I'm not radical about it. It has to be on Feast of Trumpets because it could be Pentecost. Pentecost is a good guess, too, because it's the only feast that Jesus didn't personally fulfill. He fulfilled the first three, could fulfill the last three, and Pentecost is segmented out in the middle. All right, as we wrap up this particular segment, I want to read just a little bit more from your book, End Times Made Easy. You write on page 138, Listen to me now. The rapture will be a beginning, not an ending. You are not done when you are raptured, which is why you have so much in your heart yet to do. Somebody says, I don't want the rapture to happen yet. I have so many things I still want to do for Jesus. You write, Joseph, you feel that way because you are not done. Friend, you are just tasting the powers of the world to come. And you're referring to the millennium there, by the way. And then you write, here's where your personality comes out, Joe. What happens when you get just one bite of your favorite big juicy cheeseburger or favorite sandwich? You want more. You get just a taste, and you get irritable doing without. I want the whole cheeseburger, you say. That's where you are right now in time. You've had a bite of what's to come spiritually, and you want more. Right now, you are in the process of learning the ways of God because you've got such a great big change coming. You, Christian friend, you are about to be raptured. 
when we come back from this final break. We'll talk again about what we as Christians can expect after the soon rapture of the church. Tell us again where we can get your book, End Times Made Easy. JosephMorris.com. You can go to Amazon, and uh, you can go to Barnes & Noble. The quickest way would probably be JosephMorris.com or Amazon. Yeah. And the Audible? Same thing, JosephMorris.com. Yeah. And, and the audiobook, I should say, on Audible.com. Yes. And uh, let's put in another plug for the End of Days Update. That is your podcast available on all the platforms. So just type in End of Days Update. Yes, or you can go to JosephMorris.com. There's a button there you can push. It's a, a, I try to keep it under 10 minutes, about 8 to 10 minutes, of what happened in Israel that week. Excellent. And you're also on YouTube. Yes, sir. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about what's next. All right. Back after this. I'm David Warren, Program Director at Oasis Radio Network and one of the hosts of this podcast. All of our hosts enjoy hearing from you, our listening family, so drop us a note. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and you'll receive new episodes on your mobile devices. And now, back to the show. Joseph Morris is our guest today. It's his first visit, hopefully of many, on The Road Show. I'm David Warren, your host, and I feel like I know a whole lot more about end times and the book of Revelation and all things prophetic in the Bible because I read the book, End Times Made Easy, and I listened to the audiobook on audible.com, which I like to do because I'm an audio guy. Joe, have you listened to the book or just read the book? You wrote it. Uh, I've listened to a little bit of it, but uh, mainly just, uh, and I have, I've read it several times, just want to make sure it was kind of what how it was supposed to be. Are you still learning about prophecy? Oh gosh, yes. Every day, there's just insight, and it's never ending, for sure, because there's so many things that are happening all over the earth that are like, oh Lord, that leads to the coming of the Lord, that leads to the coming of the Lord. It's exciting. All right, so we've talked about the rapture, and mm-hmm. that's a kind of where we're going to end today, because... Uh, later on comes the Ezekiel 38 war, the tribulation, followed by the great tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, there that is, mm-hmm. and then the millennial reign of Christ and how we fit into it as Christians. But uh, let's talk about what happens right after the rapture. Well, you know what? Let's back up just a tad. What will that event be like? Will we be sitting here, for example, in Studio B, having an interview, mm-hmm. and just like that, we're out of here? Yeah. I mean, the Bible says it's a, a, the shortest amount of time that can't be divided. All of a sudden, we're going to be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. We, we, we've we borne the image of the earthy. We're going to bear the image of the heavenly. And it's amazing how the stain of Adam is going to be taken off of us instantaneously, and we'll have us a new body. I like it because never be tired again, never gain weight anymore. I'm, I'm ready for a body that's not tired and, and doesn't gain weight, so it'll be wonderful. You're right. After you are raptured, your first appointment with God will be the reward seat of Christ. Now, will that be a scary thing or a joyful thing? You know, it's presented as scary, but it's supposed to be joyful, just like in the Olympics. I've never seen someone get a gold medal and be freaked out about getting up on the podium. Good point. The judgment seat of Christ, that word bema there is the reward seat. They get up on, we get up on a podium, and fire hits our life to not judge sin, but to check the motive of our heart. If either it's wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stones. You don't want a bonfire at the reward seat of Christ. You don't want a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. The amazing thing about that reward seat is he checks out the motive of your heart. Sin was laid on Jesus, so you're, you'll never be humiliated. But he will. What's the amazing thing is if you've done things with the wrong motive, that will be burned up right there. But if you were a blessing or your works were for a good motive, you'll have gold, silver, and precious stones, and you adorn yourself with your faithfulness. I want to ask you a little bit more about that. So obviously we have to have a proper motive in our hearts when we do things, but what kind of things are we rewarded for? Well, the Bible says gold, silver, and precious stones. Gold's your devotional life. But, but for doing what? Actually works for him that are unselfish. In other words, the motive of your heart is exposed. Like, I, I wanted to help that person cross the road, or I wanted to open the door for that person. Things that we think that no one sees, but he sees. Like I gave a gift to a ministry that blesses sure, me. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and he and what the amazing thing is you're going to wear that on your robe on your robe there'll be contrasting stitches showing that you went to church on Wednesday nights when other people didn't uh, there'll be another stitch on your robe showing you 
uh, we're, we're a soul winner. So your uniform, just like in the military, is going to preach for you like, oh, look what they did. You won't be jealous, but you'll go, wow, check that out. Look, like John Wesley, you know, he said, give me 10 men that hate sin and love God, and I will change the world. He's going to have a very cool robe. I was going to say, how about some, <laughs> somebody like Kenneth E. Hagen oh, or gosh. Smith Wigglesworth? or yeah. I tell people, like my dad, he never got to do anything because he had a stroke and then got saved and then died. Uh, you don't want to be running around the millennium in a speedo bathing suit. <laughs> it's like you, dad put some robes on. We're gonna be, I'm going to be borrowing robes from my father. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> well, it really preaches to you because, you know, your life preaches for you and how you'll adorn yourself with your faithfulness in the next dispensation. It'll be cool. All right. So let's say we're on the podium. Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, we're referring to uh, the reward seat of Christ at this point after the rapture, after we meet Jesus in the clouds. What kind of medals will we receive? <laughs> Well, you know, he said you'll either have gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. So the gold is your devotional life, and silver, the Bible says, the tongue of the just is choice silver. Your words either encourage or discourage. And the priest would put the stones, the precious stones, were on his chest. He, they were represented the 12 tribes of Israel, showing how he would do something that was unselfish and pray for them. He didn't go in for himself. He went in for the others. It's all about unselfishness and thoughtfulness. Really? How, how that will preach for you throughout eternity. And that's what that fire does. The things that were not with the right motive gets burned up. And I, I tell my friends that are my buddies, I go, well, I don't want a bonfire at the reward seat of Christ. Like, oh, my God, who was that? So how, how has that knowledge changed the way you live and give? It, it makes you more conscious of eternity because I'm not living for right now. Just like Paul said, I'm not running as one that beats in the air. He said, I'm running to obtain a prize. He was bold about that. Look, I'm not doing this for nothing. I'm doing this for eternity. Okay, after the reward seat of Christ, mm-hmm. then the, the final event that we'll – talk about today because there is more to come in Bible prophecy than what we're covering on today's Roadshow with Joseph Morris. I'm David Warren, your host. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. Is that a like a, a true supper where we eat, we sit at a table? I believe so. I mean, the whole thing is about a ceremony. We, we get to be, uh, we get a private ceremony where Jesus is presented to us as the king and at the second coming is a public ceremony, but that Marriage Supper of the Lamb is a, a wedding feast. Yeah, so that, I don't think of the the whole uh, protocol of all of that. How do you feed that many people with that big a meal? It'll be intriguing to see how that's all pulled off. But I mean, I mean, even the rapture, he's he's able to subdue even all things unto himself. He can change our bodies instantaneously. It's amazing. So I guess the marriage supper of the Lamb, he can handle that. So it'll be fun though. Well, Joe, it's been a treat to have you on today. We're talking about your book, End Times Made Easy, and again, this book by Joseph Morris is available wherever books are sold. That includes places like Amazon.com, but especially your website, josephmorris.com, would be a good place to check that out. Another website is audible.com if you prefer to listen to the book. But let's uh, loop back here to josephmorris.com. What kind of things can uh, we find out about on your website, and how can we hook up with you? Because I know we're wetting people's appetite because everybody wants end times made easy. Hmm. Yeah. So tell us about your website and how people can connect with your ministry. They can go to josephmorris.com, and there I put the signs on there, and uh, you can see all of our products and see different things. And on that website, you'll see the button for the end of day's update. Every week we try to do just a short uh, teaching on what happened in Israel that week because for some reason we just don't get a lot of the information here in the States. So that's been the main focus of the website, and uh, people can actually physically go look at all the signs listed there. And when you travel to speak, is this primarily what people want you to speak on in their churches? Primarily. It's weird how all of a sudden in the last probably five to ten years will you come to end times? I'm like, really? So probably 99 out of 100 are end times. Really? Yeah, which it it never was like that until just recently. And just based on this program, and we're only able to get up through the rapture and then the uh, reward seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. How do you cover end times in a church service? Boy, you know, you, it's hard. It's like people say it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's just so much information. Uh, but the whole point of it is the Lord really presses me every time I get into it, tell him how much I love him. I'll get into all the signs. I'll go, hey, look, this is not to freak you out. This is to bless you. This is to help you and get excited. And then when you see how much he loves us, it casts out all fear, too. How should we be living our lives at this point? Because based on the information you've shared in the book and today on the program, we're looking at maybe five years max. 
Man, I don't know. I, I know we're so close. It's hard. I know it freaks people out when you say that, when you get really bold about that. But, I mean, we should be hooked up with a local church. You should have a local pastor. You should be helping your local church. You should be engaged. We should be fitting churching into our life. It is our life. You know, people kind of try to fit church into their life. No, this should be the focal point. What can I do, Lord? We are that close. I look at it like a football game, and you, you have the two-minute warning, and then you got, I freak out when I see the quarterback not paying attention to the play clock. The church has to get that hustle mentality. It's not an escape theology. It's a hustle mentality. I like that. So, it's not an escape theology. It's right. a hustle mentality. Yes. So, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like the late-night hosts mocking, mm-hmm. you know, the the return of Jesus, the second coming. Of course, mm-hmm. they don't know the difference between sure. you know meeting Jesus Jesus in the clouds and the second coming. They're sure. just wanting to mock. That's right. all that they want to do. So how can we as Christians, as we get educated on the end times, because it really is something that motivates people to make a decision for Christ or not, how do we share this and come across as normal, so to speak? Right, right. I, I think it's amazing how the Lord made it simple once we go through it. Because I, I was on a plane one time to Sweden, and this lady goes, I just don't know what's going to happen. I go, I know exactly what's going to happen. Israel's regathered. Jerusalem was won back. Hebrew language was restored. Ethiopian Jews brought back. Fertility of the land of Israel. She goes, whoa. Went and got another flight attendant. We had a church service on the plane. <laughs> got another flight attendant. Because you have the answers, and that's what the amazing thing about the, the message of the coming of the Lord is, 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 is such a thought pattern of expectancy and excitement. So you're finding that as you get educated on end times, that it's not turning people off, it's turning people toward Christ, and they're very interested. I'm referring to non-believers. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. I remember right after... Uh, uh, the, during the years of the COVID years, we did some different meetings with different. Uh, I say I don't want to say centers, but businessmen. And the businessmen, when they when they start putting two and two together, they're like, "Oh my God, this is real." I had a sound guy in a meeting in Mattoon, Illinois. Came in a secular guy, and he listened to one of the sessions I did on the signs. And he walked up to me afterwards. And he said, "Now, if what you're saying is real, we should be going from house to house saying Jesus is just about to come." And you said. Absolutely. That's the, the response should be, he's about to come back, and let's go for it and do it. Well, I can't wait to see your robe in heaven. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be beautiful, Joseph. And I hope mine will be too, and all of our listeners' robes. Hey, before we say goodbye in our last few moments together, you know, I knew we'd have to put a pin in it here because uh, there's so much on the prophetic timeline. And really, would you say we're about a third through the prophetic timeline so far? Yeah, probably so far. Okay, because coming up next after we're raptured is Mm -hmm. the Ezekiel 38 war. And who Mm -hmm. are the players in that? Russia, number one, Turkey, Syria, Iran. And and you see the thought pattern right now. All that's just right in front of us. They're like, wow. So every time somebody hears on the international news, Russia— Turkey, Iran, or Syria, Mm -hmm. they need to be thinking, this is rapture. Exactly. Making us rapture ready, basically. Absolutely. That's how blatant it is and how clear it is right in front of our eyes, yeah. Okay, and then after the Ezekiel 38 war comes... You have that's during the tribulation. So you have the first thing that's going to happen. The first seal is the Antichrist is revealed. After that, you've got World War III. After that, you've got hyperinflation. So just based on those three, look how clear that's showing us right now how that's getting ready to happen. And then the Great Tribulation, that takes place at the midway mark, correct? Correct. Uh-huh. The three-and-a-half-year mark. And what will that second half be like? Well, you know, I, haven't, I don't preach on the Tribulation very much, but once you get into it, the first half is already horrific, and the second half is even more, much more worse. So hell like, on earth. Hell on earth. I like what one lady said. She said, you know, it's like hell on earth. At least it's better than going to hell forever. So the pressure gets put on people to accept Jesus. So it's better than at least going to hell. Yeah. And then the second coming of Jesus. Yeah, the event where the earth gets to see him come back as the king. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Yes. And then after the second coming of Jesus. That's the cool part, the millennial reign of Christ. You know, I think that's the number one thing that, that people freak out when I preach on the millennial reign because we don't hear that many messages on it. When they actually see that it's going to, how fun it's going to be. And how, think of the earth without the curse and, and us having jobs and riding motorcycles or whatever. I mean, there, people think we're going to just do, just worship. No, we're, we're, the Lord told me, tell them they've never seen a roller coaster until they see one during the millennium. I'm like, wow. Oh, wow, I'm in. And so, like, our sound guy here, Tim Maroney, will he be doing sound in heaven? 
He'll be doing sound in heaven. He'll have so much fun. He'll do. Isn't that weird how the desire of our heart, I believe, we'll, we'll have exactly what we want. All right. Well, he'll be the best up in heaven. The best sound. We'll man. have the best acoustics and sound in heaven. Thank you, Tim Maroney, for being our sound man today. Thumb up from him. Joseph Morris, come back and explain these things we just touched on just now. We want to know where we are on God's timeline. But the next step thing is the rapture of the church so we need to be rapture ready yes do we have christ in our hearts yes yes thank you for having me on and are we telling others about christ as well Uh, number one that's it soul winners josephmorris.com is your website address people can learn more about you and the new book in times made easy and folks i just want you to go there and just tell him how much you enjoyed today's program and again the book is available wherever books are sold also on audible.com if you want the audiobook End Times Made Easy by today's special guest, Joseph Morris. Well, for our sound man, Tim, I'm David Warren. Thank you again, Joe, for being with us today. Thank you. Thrilled to be with you. Thank you so much. It's been another great roadshow. You've been listening to The Roadshow. If you'd like to write to us, here's our address. The Roadshow, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation.